so much for your patience. We are trying to figure it out. So Randy and JT, thank you for hanging there and running this room as we are trying to figure out what is going on. The two experts here can't talk and hear us in the metaverse, but hey, things happen. That's what it is. Dan, are you ready? Yes, I am ready. So let's get started here. Share this room. Press that plus symbol. Now we're going to get started. Invite everyone in. Our goal is to impact everybody here. So we have Jeremy here. I'm going to tell you about Jeremy. Then we'll jump into this interview. And we're also going live streaming. But Jeremy leads PWC's Metaverse Technologies team, helping clients across all industries successfully implement technologies like virtual reality and augmented reality. He is also the author, author of Reality Check, a book that anyone can pick up to better understand how these technologies are being used in businesses all over the world. He has been featured in the Financial Times, The Economist, BBC, and other media outlets, and he has worked with organizations like the World Economic Forum and currently sits on the advisory board of Immerse UK to support the growth, growth of metaverse technologies in business. Welcome, Jeremy. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Welcome Welcome to be here. To be here. I'm very excited, excited to talk to you today, today about, about the, wonders the wonders of the metaverse, of the metaverse and the technologies, the technologies that underpin it, in particular, in particular virtual, reality virtual reality and reality. reality. Yes, yes, well, Jeremy, before, before we go into that, that, can you tell us what was your journey like to get where you are? Oh, the journey was a long and windy one. Believe it or not, I started my my career as an auditor. So I am a chartered accountant. I have I put it on my profile, so uh, the disclaimer is there in front of you, uh, fully visible and transparent. Um, but as I was pursuing my career, I, I figured that I'd like to be involved in something that was more akin to my interest, more aligned to my interest. And so I looked at I looked at innovation work. Now, innovation work involves looking at a number of different technologies from virtual reality and augmented reality all the way through to artificial intelligence, 3D printing, robotics, and all this good stuff. But as, as I'm sure everyone in the audience knows, it's really difficult to gain a proper and deep understanding of just one of these technology areas, let alone all of them. So I wanted to... I wanted to build a deeper set of knowledge in one particular specialist area. And I chose virtual reality and augmented reality because to me, that is such a visceral, experiential, immersive set of technologies, such a unique technology that is visual, it is front end. Um, and although Although a lot of people are excited by a lot of other back-end technologies like artificial intelligence, I just felt that this technology is, is something that has been in our minds for ever since humanity started with storytelling. And we now have the ultimate form of storytelling at our disposal. Um, and it has applications in both the personal, the personal, the consumer world and the business world. And for those reasons, I started pursuing um, a, um, a career in that route. And found a found an opportunity here in PwC to progress it. Well, thank you so much, um, Jeremy and Melanie. You ready? Go ahead, Mel. Oh, we cannot hear Mel at all. Can you unmute here? Sorry, guys. You can unmute. You have to mute. Unmute your. Oh, hello. There you can go. You hear perfect. Me? Oh, oh my God! All those technical issues today. Uh, Dan, Kate, thanks for um, having me back um, in this in this room, and uh, and I'm so glad that I'm able to bring Jeremy on because Jeremy and I are obsessed with future of work, and uh, and the technologies uh, surrounding future of work. So I'm going to jump right in and pick Jeremy's brain since I have him here. And yesterday we had an amazing conversation. Can you guys still hear me? <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> can I not use the headset and just speak to the phone that way that you guys can hear me? I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Is it better now? Oh, no. I Oh my God, it's like $300 pair of headset and it's like crap. <laughs> um, so Jeremy, you and I had a, uh, we had a great conversation yesterday in regards of uh, use cases in the, in the enterprise space of using this 
XR um, and uh, metaverse technology. And, and I would love for you to define it further for us. How do you see this uh, metaverse uh, being used in future of work? Uh, you know, you and I discussed a few use cases remote collaboration we talked about soft skill training product demo perhaps we can uh highlight a couple of those and do a deeper dive yeah absolutely so when we talk about the the metaverse as a concept the reason we've chosen the term metaverse technologies is because there are a lot of different technologies that underpin the metaverse you've got virtual reality you've got augmented reality you've mm -hmm. got blockchain technology um, and, and many, many more. But our particular area of interest that we've really been progressing is the technology that gives us access to the metaverse in the most immersive way possible, which is virtual reality. Now, mm -hmm. as we know, we can access the metaverse using standard computer hardware like our, our laptops and so on. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when you put a headset on and you're able to immerse yourself in that world using virtual reality technology, that's when it becomes a, a very visceral um, emotional experience. And that's the type of that's the type of stuff we're interested in, even from a business perspective. You may not think that emotions and business uh, match together really well, but in fact, you do want to create emotional reactions within business for a number of reasons. And one of them, to talk about the two big use cases or applications mm. of, uh, of these metaverse technologies, one is for remote coll collaboration or how do you work together when you're in completely different locations? And the second one is around soft skills training. So anything to do with, with human skills that, that deal with people, you know, that could be public speaking, that could be um, sales training, that could be diversity and inclusion training, anything to do with, with these areas and more, virtual reality as a metaverse technology is a fantastic way to, um, to apply and, and build those skills and, uh, and to work remotely together. And for those who I know, Kate, you wanted us to define further like XR, VR, AR, I'm just going to say XR is extended reality, it's an umbrella, right? And then VR is virtual reality and AR is augmented reality. Did I get it right, Jeremy? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then the way that you and I talked about it yesterday was you, you're saying that uh, PwC is now placing metaverse above it all just because it's it's broadened, right? The, the, the technologies that are coming coming from this this i would say mainstream now i you know we know that we've been on this metaverse world for a fairly long time jeremy but it's only in the last few months that it's become mainstream um so we can do let's talk a little bit more about the remote collaboration piece i'm very excited about this because i've worked from home i've built my studio you know working from home for the last 20 plus years. So this is very uh, normal to me, but in a, in a corporate setting, um, especially for a, you know, a global company like yours, tell us a little bit more about how you're using the metaverse to connect to, I don't know how many, how many locations do you guys have and how many employees do you have at PwC? So we've got we've got locations all over the world in every mm -hmm. major city. In terms mm -hmm. of the the number of employees, it's reaching nearly three hundred thousand. So uh, there's definitely a large number of people to try and bring together and work together. And and these type of technologies really help uh, with that, especially when you can't meet face to face. And that's not always possible for a number of reasons. You might not be able to meet in person due to financial constraints. Uh, you know, money. You might not be able to meet in person due to time, lack of time, might be health concerns, accessibility concerns, um, the hassle of having to organize logistics and transportation. There are a whole host of reasons why you may not be able to meet face to face, but you might still want to work uh, together in a really impactful manner. And so virtual reality acts as that bridge right in the middle to give you the best of both worlds, the convenience of an instant meeting with the, the impact of an in-person meeting. Right. And you and I talked about yesterday on my end here, we just scaled out, you know, rolled out, a, 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 you know, onboarding for 2000 people. And it was an insane feat, a Herculean feat, right, to get 
Oculus in the hands of 2,000 people across the Super globe. And it, 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 was, it was done successfully. But like you said, you know, getting the Oculus to certain countries could be an issue. Tell us a bit about, about that. Just the simple thing as getting the Oculus to another co-worker in Asia could be yeah, a problem. Absolutely. I mean, um, just to give you an example, we we did a, a smaller project very recently to almost 300 people in, in over 40 countries around the world. And, um, and that was logistically very challenging for a number of reasons, not only for the obvious ones, which you might expect in terms of having to deliver to different to different places and, and coordinating um, you know, different uh, partners to manage that delivery, but also things like the import um, of those headsets and that hardware into countries can be a problem because you've got um, you've got some countries that will apply levies to it as soon as they they enter the uh, enter the country in terms of um, uh, bringing in those headsets and in some cases we were charged um, up to about half the value of the entire headset just to have it allowed into the country and for those of you who are wondering why don't we just buy a headset in that country uh, the not every country supports each of the headsets and uh, the ones that we were using uh, weren't available in 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 that uh, in that country so we had to ship them from outside right even on the discussion of headsets right yes the oculus quest 2 is fairly reasonable uh you know three hundred dollars you know you can get a nice it's, it's good quality experience and then even when we were researching here like what re what we recommend our clients they jump from like 300 bucks to like 1500 dollars and and you know realistically you can't buy you know thousands of employees at, at that price point um but also the 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 then the question would be looking at whether or not the enterprise is ready to roll out a program using you know an oculus which is owned by facebook and then you have to have an you know a facebook account to use the oculus Th these are the things that you know on a consumer side it's fairly easy you're like oh it's okay i'll just hook up my facebook i'll set up facebook but on an enterprise solution it's not necessarily as easy because of privacy compliance issues um, and, and I have to bring that up all the time. It's not as easy as you think because on the enterprise side, not not all clients want to have their employees set up a Facebook account. And then and then yeah. so we have to figure out ways to go around that, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and, yeah, you're 100% right. And, and funny you mentioned that the, the, uh, the, uh, the Oculus Quest 2, um, which is used by, by a lot of uh, organizations now, it does have challenges with regards to data privacy. And you might expect that the two versions, the enterprise version and the the consumer yeah. version, it's now it's now all being it's now all being streamlined into one unit. But prior to to 2022, you had two versions to choose from. Yeah. Um, even then, if you if you use the consumer unit for business purposes, which you were eventually allowed to do uh, in in the Oculus terms and agreement, mm -hmm. you had to, as you were saying, Mel, sign up for a Facebook account. Um, in which case, how do you manage that? Whose account is it? Are you going to create a dummy account? Does that, is it okay to do that given Facebook's terms and conditions within Facebook itself? Yeah. Lots of questions up in the air about that. If you go for the enterprise unit, then you're going to pay double the price. Yeah. Um, and yes, there's going to be uh, less data captured, but there's not going to be no data captured. There is still data being collected on enterprise headsets. Mm -hmm. um, in which is going to cause, you know, could cause problems with, uh, with from a data privacy and protection angle. Um, so there are lots of so many different things to think about, and yes. it's not only Oculus as 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 a vendor that is offering um, enterprise headsets in the market. You also have people like HTC, you have yeah, people like Pico from China, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, and even um, a, a French manufacturer, Lynx, now we went over to Paris to have a look at their latest headsets. And they've got some really interesting stuff going on there. Um, a very light headset where you can flip up the visor very easily and thus, you know, makes it a little bit a little bit more user friendly to jump in and out of, you know, your metaverse platform and the real world, for example. Um, little and we'll talk, I know we'll talk about user experience um, later, yeah. but those little things like that are really important when it comes to driving adoption in the consumer world as well. Yes. Because consumers do not have the, the time, energy, willpower 
to, in, to to engage with a lengthy manual on how to use this hardware. It needs to be intuitive. It needs to be understandable. It needs to be light, comfortable. It even needs to be fashionable, you know, which is something that enterprise doesn't think about. But if we want this to go mainstream, people mm -hmm. need to be happy to put this stuff on their faces. You know, mm -hmm. it's a very intrusive thing to do to disconnect you from the real world while at the same time making you conscious of someone else in the real world looking at you with a piece of hardware strapped to your face over your eyes. Right. So having said that, let's talk about the onboarding. So so we're done talking about hardware. We selected a hardware, let's say. We'll go, let's say we go with Quest, okay? And then now we're talking about onboarding at scale. Um, and it's training people to, okay, the Facebook part, let's say we get that under control. And then now is actually training someone to put it on and actually get into a platform or an app that the enterprise is going to choose for this remote collaboration to happen, right? I, I just wanted the audience to understand that this is not a simple onboarding process. Like you got to go to Facebook and then you have to choose an app or a platform that is going to support this remote collaboration that you and I, Jeremy, have talked about for enterprise solution. Now, again, we discussed this yesterday, um, the difference between, or not the difference, but more of measurement, um, you know, choosing between accessibility and, and immersion, right, as, as the two key ingredient on which platform an enterprise would choose. Some would choose accessibility, and that's why you and I talked about, um, you know, platforms that you can have an experience on the desktop, you know, on, on you know, laptop, iPad, and your mobile devices, and then the perk is, okay, you know, you get, you get, you can still put on your Oculus and you can still experience that. Or you go full-blown, high fidelity, beautiful experiences, spatial audio, all that bells and whistles that may not necessarily translate at scale. So let's talk a little bit up about that in, in the use cases, um, you know, especially for remote collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of those two different avenues you, that you have, um, you, you have to make a trade off because yes, you can send out headsets and we do send out headsets all the time to, to clients and to staff to, because they, they don't have their own right now. In the future, we definitely see their there being a um, it being standard that all companies will provide a new joiner to the organization with a laptop, a mobile phone, oh, okay. and their virtual reality headset. Um, but for for now, you know, we've got to provide them with that hardware because it's not standard yet. Yes. Um, yes. So yes, we give them that hardware. But if we don't have enough hardware, then the next level down from that to ensure that they do still have an experience, even though it may not be the most immersive one, is to give them access to a companion application equivalent on their on their laptop or desktop equivalent, and um, we. And we would we would choose that depending on the on the scope of the project, the number of people, the amount of hardware. But you're always going to make a trade off between the increased accessibility of a desktop piece of software and the increased immersion that comes from the using the head mounted mm -hmm. display that allows you to be more immersed in that world. I don't like the word trade-off. <laughs> I want <laughs> both. <laughs> I know. In the future We're we'll have both. Yes, and again, the future, like how how do you anticipate this kind of merging soon? Like for, from from my experience here, I, I I'm always opting for the immersion, right? Because I I'm a, the the user experience design, and I'm always focused on I want it to be sensational and memorable when someone goes into even on the desktop or the especially on the Oculus. I want you to be so wow that you want to come back and do this with your coworker, right? Um, but there has been, and, you know, big challenges. People. Yeah, and we want people to uh, to 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 understand and feel what it's like to use this cutting edge technology, so we can move more people into the future, one by one, slowly, slowly and surely. We get people understanding how to use the technology, and we were talking about onboarding. There, it's yeah. it's a complicated process to get people yeah. bought into this tech because even when we pre-select the the software that we're going to use to allow yeah. for this remote collaboration to take place yeah. that's just one step 
even after we get them sent the headset so it's right there in front of them and they're ready to go just turn it on we still have to run an onboarding session with them remotely mm -hmm. we have dedicated people that do that some usually in a group to make it more efficient but we'll get on a on a call you know like uh, like we're having um and we'll be able to run them through two two areas the first one being the hardware how do you put the hardware on how do you put how do you manage it if you wear glasses um, what do you do if you have a lot of hair you know all of these little things that you might not think about um, they need to be managed uh, carefully especially for people who've never used this this sort of uh, technology before. Right. right and once you've got the headset on and you're able to use the controllers and you understand what all the buttons do that's only the first step then the mm -hmm. second one is you open the software that we're going to use for remote collaboration and we instruct you and guide you on how to use that platform. How do you bring a whiteboard up? How do you pick up your digital pen to then write on the whiteboard? How do you speak to people in the virtual environment? How do you mute yourself? How do I bring objects in? How do I move them? How do I move myself within that world? It's like teaching someone how to use a computer for the first time. It's just a different type of computer, right? It's the medium of virtual reality as opposed to the medium of desktop computing. Right. And then in the in the in the in the sense of there's two sets of training that I've, I've noticed. One is training for the user who is actually going in and actually um, watching um, less active and, you know, they're called the passive users. And then there's the active users who are the keynote presenters. Then now we have to train them to present in their avatars, feel comfortable enough to bring in 3D objects as they go through a product demo. And then um, realizing that they have to cut short their typical, you know, one hour PowerPoint presentation down to 15 minutes because people may get nauseous. <laughs> so. This yeah. is another good point, actually. You know, we we can't just take what we know about the, the the way we conduct business currently and the way we we collaborate remotely currently and just apply it in a no. virtual reality environment. You know, it just doesn't gel. We can't have people sitting for hours in in virtual reality just listening to someone up on stage. You know, you have to use the technology for the right purpose where it suits mm -hmm. using vr4 so if it's a if it's just simply a presentation one or uh, information coming in it from one direction only then do you need virtual reality for that P probably not but if you're trying to workshop something and you're trying to work literally work together with people to whiteboard ideate brainstorm new ideas get you know get the uh, creative juices flowing and writing on whiteboards then that's when virtual reality really comes into its own particularly when you can't meet face to face which yes let's admit is the gold standard and virtual reality is not designed to replace that in all instances but it gets us you know 70 percent 80 percent there which is better than what we have with video conferencing currently for a lot of these scenarios Right. And Jan, you, Mel, I have a question for both of you. How far along are we? I mean, right now, it's very pricely to do all this. Like for a small entrepreneur, it's just too expensive and it doesn't make sense. So how far are we maybe in the next five, 10 years before it's a little bit more affordable to everyone? Define affordable because <laughs> a gamer can tell you that the Oculus Quest 2 is a very cheap device, right? I mean, they invest, you know, hard, you know, hardware is like the biggest thing, right? They want the best, you know, uh, graphics. Um, platform wise, um, uh, from my experience, there are great platforms for collaboration and, you know, somewhat beautiful metaverse, like, you know, Spatial, which I've recommended you, Kate, and I've built some spaces in there. They're great for, like, the consumer side. You can connect your meta wallet. You can have your NFTs. And graphically, it's just really gorgeous. Um, fairly reasonable pricing, I think, um, even for their pro account. Then you step up. Then you step up to the ones that can actually do all the bells and whistles, and they're like very, very expensive. However, that's a that's a that's a thing to that that I wanted to bring up with Jeremy and I talked about. A lot of these platforms are still struggling with the whole instancing issue of capping the amount of people that are able to collaborate within a metaverse space up to like 50 people now 
before when it started, it was like 25 or 30 people. Now everyone is saying, oh, 50 people is the normal count. And then what happens after the 50 people, you get kicked out or you or it will automatically duplicate the room for you. But then you won't be seeing your friend that's in the first room. You'll see new friends in the second room. All of that you have to take into account. And and that technology, I have to say, it's not quite there yet, Jeremy, <laughs> right? Because you may lose people. And yeah. uh, and the more objects you have within the space, yes, you will slow it down. That's why these platform guys are always very concerned. What are you uploading? What kind of 3D objects are you bringing in? How long is this event? Like they are very, because they have to pump juice into this, <laughs> into your metaverse to make it run however long you want it to run. You know what? And you know what makes it really difficult? For, for people in, in our position to evangelize this emerging technology, there is, everyone expects every, to, everything to run smoothly. That's just human expectation. And when things yeah. don't go 100% right, people get, they get annoyed, they get disillusioned, they lose trust in the technology. And it's a really difficult position to be in when you're trying to manage what is a very, a relatively new technology to the market to make sure that it is 100% reliable in, in all sorts of ways. I mean, even for video conferencing, even for, you know, us trying to get onto uh, to Clubhouse using pretty standard technology, you know, <laughs> we, we're having a bit of a struggle here, but it's okay because this is accepted now. You know, so yeah. people are a bit more forgiving of it. But if it's an emerging technology and something like this happens, then instantly everyone will dismiss it and they'll say, yes, this technology is not ready. It's clearly immature. We cannot implement this in enterprise. And it is it can have a devastating impact, which is why we spend so much time trying to make sure the user experience is as smooth as possible, despite the fact that we are really fighting a difficult uphill battle here. Imagine yeah, that, right? Imagine yeah. that they want it to be phenomenal, beautiful, engaging, and do all these things, but oh, it cannot, we cannot have glitches. It has to be one login click. And, and I'm just like, oh my God, my list of my success metric has changed <laughs> as, a, as a user experience designer. And I'm looking, oh my God, how do we redefine this metric of success? Like, you know, can we hit like the top 10 and then say it's success, or do we need to hit all 50 of these <laughs> checklists? It's it's been it's been like you said, Jeremy. It's been a uphill battle, as but many very yes, many. But it's been so exciting, though. I mean, I mean, look, even within six months, right? I I, I talk to these platform guys, and I'm like, oh, now you guys can do this, this, this. But there's something that's still being worked out. And back to Kate's question, you know, the pricing, it, I think it, it depends on whether or not the platform is catering to the consumer end or the enterprise solution. Again, on the enterprise side, Jeremy, you know, for, for me, you know, there's the data privacy and compliance is a big thing, right? And also the logging issues with the IT. And so we have to select platforms that are, you know, complying to all of these things that the, the client would need because a lot of the data that's being streamed or content that's being streamed, it's it has to be secured. And, uh, you know, a lot of these platforms may not have that yet. All right. Um, All right, so we need to rephrase that for our live audience because no one can hear Lee. So Mel, can you tell us um, if we can keep our questions later? That way we don't confuse our live um, audience right now. Mel, can you? So Lee was asking specifically about uh, uh, data, data privacy and security. Um, and um, I think, and, and Jeremy, you you need to, you may need to chime in on his, but um, for some of our corporate clients, they are very specific, right? And they need to be the one identifying whether or not the event that they're hosting is going to be open to all, invite only, partners only, investors only, what exactly the content is going to be and who's presenting. Once we define that, then we can say maybe some of this content can live here and then some of this 
it needs to live over here. And then for the ones that are really private, then it's invite only with some kind of, uh, you know, that you can get a link or you will have to register and it has to be pre-registered, whatever, whatever, you know, workflow that the organization is used to. It is similar to like Zoom used to have, you know, Zoom had refined itself in the last couple of years since the pandemic. But when it when the pandemic first hit, there was a lot of uh, data privacy, you know, issues, right? Like people could hack in and get the link and, you know, Zoom bombed and all that. Same thing in the metaverse world. We, we, we are very cognizant about, you know, we may not trust the platform completely yet because they're still trying to figure out the kinks. So for us, is what can we control as an enterprise? What kind of data are we going to feel secure putting onto this in this these platforms? And then how long does the data live there? And if it does get leaked out, is that is that okay? Um, and if it's if it's not, then let's choose another you know more secure platform. So again, it's it's hard for me to define, but again, I always revert it back to my client and their legal team and their IT team, and they have a whole list of checklists that need to go through. I am not uh, fully aware of that process, but I do, uh, on my end is, I'm more concerned about what kind of content are you asking me to create and where would this content live and who's going to have access. A good way to think about it is, let's assume that you're accessing a metaverse environment through a virtual reality headset. Now let's split this activity into its components from a from a security standpoint. Now, a security team will see this and they'll go, okay, so this metaverse platform is a piece of software. Now, what are the what is that what is that software? Um, what ports does that software have access to? Um, how is that software protecting the the, the data that flows through it? Um, is it using any form of encryption and so on? Where is it storing data? Um, is it recording anything in the environment and where is that stored? Um, does it have, when you when you use the piece of software, how do you log into it? You know, if you have an avatar, mm -hmm. is there a mm -hmm. security uh, procedure around that, such as a username and password, which only once you input it allows you access to that avatar, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there'll be a yeah. lot of... A lot of safeguard questions. Yeah, sorry, Mel. Right, right. Even with the avatar, right, Jeremy? Because we talked about this yesterday. Even with avatar selection, some mm -hmm. clients are very picky about selecting a platform that they want to ensure that the avatar actually has a resemblance to the actual person. Yes, yes. Right. That a lot. Versus, yeah, and then versus another client who's like, oh, I don't mind a cartoony Robloxy yeah. type yeah, yeah, yeah. avatar. Yeah, we're okay with that. So again, it's up to the the enterprise how how comfortable they are with this technology. But so far, my enterprise clients they've been very picky. We want avatar to look like us. We don't mind dressing up as a rock star, but we just want to make sure that employees are going to be talking to so and so that actually looked like that and they insisted on getting your avatar set up right from the get and again <laughs> another whole <laughs> onboarding exactly issue right and, and that's just the software component you know then yeah. you've got the hardware component you know the headset that you're actually using now the headset provides you with with processing power, sure, but it also has it also has other linkages to this. The headset needs to connect to the internet in order to allow that data back and forth when you are talking to others and when you're receiving a talk mm -hmm. from other people and discussions. Um, and if that's the case, any device that is connected to the internet, now suddenly there's a worry around there. Um, how is that being managed? If you're if you're managing those devices remotely, as 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 a lot of enterprises would do, you for anyone that doesn't know, there's there are suites of software called MDM platforms, mobile device management systems. They are designed to help manage all of your your mobile phones and laptops in your corporate organization. Then you may have thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of employees. And all of those mobile phones and, and laptops need to be managed. They can't be managed by a person in, in person. That would be really mm -hmm. difficult and not scalable. So instead, you've got a piece of software which sits outside and it connects to all your devices and it allows a remote team to manage them. Same thing for virtual reality headsets. We're now seeing MDM solutions that allow you to control those headsets and 
once those heads get, headsets get brought into the enterprise, they have to adhere to IT standards. They have to have the latest yes. version of Android, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there are so many areas to think about from a security standpoint. I think we could have an entire session on security and the bullet points around it, and we still wouldn't be finished. And that's why we have the, our dedicated IT teams, which I'm very thankful <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> That's why we both couldn't hear each other this morning. And I'm like, there you go. Of the oh, I, feel yeah. bad. I feel bad for blaming okay. you. That's why I'm thanking okay. them now. <laughs> okay, so Jeremy, I have a question for you and Mel. We all know it's very pricey. Why, from a consumer standpoint, why are we wearing this goddamn Oculus and be in a wonky, not beautiful world? How are we going to convince the consumer to be in a meeting there when we will feel dizzy in the next few hours? Why? Hey, Kate, I mean, I you... love the metaverse. I mean, that's why I'm part of it. But that's what most people are thinking. Dan, do you want to do a reset before? Yeah, just so yeah. That? No worries. Yeah, no, it's a good question. So we are talking through the metaverse masterclass here. We have Jeremy Dalton and Mel Lim, who has been here a few times. Thank you, Mel. You kind of kicked off this whole metaverse a few months ago. So uh, thank you all for being here. The Metaverse Masterclass. You can check out the Metaverse Collective if you go to metaversecollective.io. The link is here as well. You can check that out. This is what we're all about, bringing in these incredible people who have expertise in these areas and are going to answer questions shortly here from the audience. But we'll keep it going. I'm going to hand it back to you, Jeremy. So, uh, so Kate, you were asking, why are we putting these headsets on our face, you know, when they're wonky and they're not providing us with the ultimate, you know, user experience and smooth, uh, and they're not a smooth solution like what we have now. And the reason is because those of us who are doing that are part of a population of people called innovators or early adopters. And we're very proud <laughs> to, be testing, <laughs> to be testing out this solution, even though it's not quite ready for the mainstream market yet or the, 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 the late majority market. We're there to test that solution out. We're excited about it. We see the potential for the future. We recognize the problems. We understand them. We acknowledge them. But we also want to provide feedback to drive them forward, to fix them so that those in the future who are less patient than we are can benefit from them and and enjoy them How, what do you think mel does that sound about right yes i agree one thousand percent and also from uh, i'm gonna do a little bit of experience share um talking about technology uh as we're evaluating all these different platforms and the clients say oh we want to do this we want to do that we want to stream ourselves into these metaverses you know i know we're talking about volumetric right hologram volumetric hologram oh, so it's you know and and then and then and then you talk to all these platform, platform guys and they're like no we're not quite there yet but we're willing to write a code that's going to embed the volumetric data into our platform so that's where the whole innovation comes in kate it's because yeah. there's an idea and then it's not quite there yet but there are people these people are so eager to figure out how to do this integration and work with you know some guy from israel and some guy from this country and they're gonna figure out how to you know write codes for each other because the technology is growing and and the use cases are expanding mm. and that's why you know to 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 add to what jeremy is saying this is the innovation that we're both excited about right jeremy it's like Absolutely. looking at it's like oh yes we can do this and we can bring this guy in and it's not there yet but we can work it out and of course throughout the process we'll there will be we'll there will be you know challenges there will be disappointments and <laughs> it's costly um but we'll get there yes <laughs> can i can i talk for one minute about the volumetric points Mel? yes because yes. this is super exciting so for those yes. of you in the audience who have never heard the term volumetric volumetric video, volumetric capture, anything like that. This is a really exciting technology that we've played around with and we've used in products, in virtual reality products. So to give you an idea of what this is about, when you, when you take a video of someone normally with a video camera, you're basically getting like a 2D cutout of them, right? It's not a three-dimensional person you're filming, right? But it looks really photorealistic because it's captured from the real world. Now, 
there are specialist studios, volumetric capture studios, and there are only handfuls in different parts of the world. There's there's one in South London, for example, um, called Dimension, if anyone's interested. We've worked with them in the past. And they have effectively, if I can build this picture in your mind, you go into the studio, you're in like a cylindrical room, which is fully green screen. So there's green absolutely everywhere. And they've got, if I remember correctly, I think it was 106 cameras or 108 cameras in there. And they're all around you on the interior of this cylinder, right? And half of those cameras are, are normal video cameras, right? That you, you would use at home, you know, when you're on holiday. Um, and the other half are depth sensors. So what these devices are doing is they're sending, uh, they're sending infrared like into many points on your body, right? And they're measuring the distance between the camera and the point as it hits your body. So for example, if it hit my chest, that would be a longer distance than if it hit the edge of my nose. My nose is not that big, but you get the point, right? <laughs> and um, imagine once you have all of those readings all around your body, you've got effectively the information to build a 3D model, right? And once you've got that 3D model, you slap on the texture, the video, right, that you took with the other half of the cameras, and all of a sudden, you have a photorealistic, three-dimensional human being that you can import into metaverse environments, virtual reality applications, augmented reality applications. It's super, super exciting tech. Very expensive, but um, as, you know, as we were getting to with Kate, cost will come down, it will become easier, it will become more available, it will become more standard eventually. Yes. Yes. I just wanted to talk about volumetric because I heard you say. I know. Well. <laughs> <laughs> you and I can that's talk really offline. Exciting. We can we can talk online because I can introduce <laughs> you to another company that I know that's doing really fun stuff. But yes. <laughs> looking forward to it. Looking forward. Yes, to it. Wow, then that's amazing. You see, so, Dan, go ahead. No, I was I was running it because I think with the you know the whole avatar, it's it's always about it doesn't really look like you. You know, I've seen some of the three-dimensional, even, you know, Apple can do the three-dimensional version of, of your kind of avatar. But do you see this then in the future that people will use this technology once it becomes more affordable? So you can actually have somebody who looks very, very close to what you actually look like. And that could potentially be your avatar. Or maybe if I want to look like somebody else, maybe they could sell me their realistic version of what they look like. Yeah, I'll let Mel go these, first. Yeah, most of these platforms, um, then they already have the tag where they can just, you can either use the camera and then when you sign up, you know, for the avatar, you just have to rotate your face just like the Apple, right? Apple Apple uh, uh, phones. And they'll just scan and then they'll build an avatar um, and that will be your avatar for you to, to navigate within the metaverse. Now, your hair and everything may be a little wonky and you may look bald on the back, you know? <laughs> it depends on how It's fine how for me, Mel. It's absolutely <laughs> fine for me. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, the, but the technology is slowly. But what we're talking about the volumetric is it's beyond the avatar. It's really moving the body, and it's 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 like it's like a data from Star Trek being beamed into <laughs> the, the Enterprise. But anyway, I don't want to get too geeky on that. Um, well, I still have Jeremy. I have two more things that I wanted to ask him. Jeremy, you and I talked about yesterday about this virtual park. That you're very excited about and then you you had mentioned like thousands and thousands of users right going into ex experience this virtual part yes, and then yes. uh, and then the last thing i wanted to talk about is uh we can download a report from pwc that's coming out that's going to show the economic impact of metaverse so yes two things before you have yes. to run. so i will i will succinctly summarize the all the activities the exciting stuff that's going on um, we released a report called Seeing is Believing, and this is publicly and freely available. You don't need to put any details in to access it. Um, but this was an attempt to answer the question, what is the global economic impact of virtual reality and augmented reality? So part of the, the metaverse technologies, significant parts of the metaverse technologies. And what we found in working with our economics team is that by 2030, we expect these technologies to add one and a half trillion dollars to the global economy, which is absolutely amazing. And that's that's due to a wide range of use cases of which training is one of them, of which using this technology in retail is another um, in terms of how we improve 
the way we we run processes in business, how we improve healthcare outcomes and surgeries, mm -hmm. how we build products, how we work together. You know, we were talking about remote collaboration. All of mm -hmm. this stuff feeds into creating a more efficient economy for us in, in all countries around the world. Now, what we're going to do this year in, in the first half, so we're expecting to release this this secondary report by the summer is we're going to take that analysis we're going to update it for 2022 and beyond to 2030 and we're going to say look let's not only analyze the economic impact of vr and ar but let's take it to the superset let's take it to the metaverse technologies in general as a large grouping to answer the question how much impact do we expect the metaverse to have on our global economy by 2030 and beyond. So keep an eye out for that. Again, that will be freely and publicly available. And then the second point, Mel, you mentioned was um, virtual park. And this is this is a uh, a, a, th a three dimensional platform um, that allows people to come together. Uh, in usually via desktop, you can access it via virtual reality headsets, but most people will access it via their computers. And what we found is this is an amazing way to engage with students throughout the UK to, to tell them more about PwC and what we're doing and help embed them in our culture. Um, and so we, since we, we started running Virtual Park um, and, and making these virtual events accessible in this virtual world, we've had over 17,000 students come join us in this environment. And each one of them is able to have their own journey and go listen to some of our talks in the virtual auditorium, go to the virtual expo hall and, um, and, and meet our different business network groups and communities. So it's been a really wonderful way to think about how the metaverse can bring communities together, how they can connect people to organizations, how they can help people find jobs and find, you know, and, mm -hmm. and build careers. So it's something we're very excited about and we'll definitely continue to invest in. Great. Uh, Jeremy has to run. Uh, Kate, shall we? Uh, you have one more question for him. Can he take one more question from the audience or something? No. <laughs> where can they find you, Jeremy? So, what, 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 um, your site? Best way to find me is via my my, my personal website, which is jeremydaltonxr.com. And uh, there you'll find access to all of my different handles, whether it's LinkedIn, Twitter, and so on. Um, or just, um, you know, you can, you can find me, you can find all those details on my Clubhouse profile if you're listening there as well. Um, but otherwise, really appreciate you all listening. Um, thank you, Kate and Dan, for being wonderful hosts. And Mel, for being a, a fantastic co-speaker. Really enjoyed chatting with you on, on all things Metaverse. Yes, yes, we shall talk more. <laughs> I look forward Online. to Online. Yes. yes, well, Jeremy, you have to come back here once. I'll, I'm, I'll come back anytime. Up. Anytime yes, you want, absolutely. Kate. Just give me the call. Give me the call. Tell me the time. I will be there. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Let's open our mic and thank Jeremy for being here today. He's based in the UK, and that's woo, Thanks, amazing. Everyone. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that, everyone. And I'll catch you soon. Bye-bye.